welcome. How many are from uh, outside of San Diego? Oh, we got quite a crowd here. Great. Uh, mostly Chandler fans, I am assuming. Uh, welcome one and all. Uh, my name is Lauren Lapker, and uh, I guess I'm responsible for all of this. So if there's any blame to go around, a buck stops here. Uh, thank you. When I started uh, my website, Shamistown, in uh, 2004, I would never have envisioned anything like this. And even when I started on this uh, quest to reunite Sissy and Ray in 2009, I didn't imagine anything like this. In fact, I didn't think we'd ever get past the, uh, the courtroom stage, but uh, we did. And um, given Ray's feelings about death, I don't think we should be too surprised that uh, Sissy languished in permanent storage, as they called it, for 57 years. Uh, however, I think if he had seen uh, where she was before he died, I don't think he would have been pleased, and I think he would, re would have regretted his inebriated inaction. Uh, before Tom Heine, uh, some of you might recognize the name, he wrote a biography of uh, Raymond Chandler. He's now in England studying to be an Anglican minister. And before he would sign my petition, uh, he asked uh, his retired bishop, uh, Robert Mercer, for his opinion on uh, what I was doing. And Bishop Mercer wrote back to him, the problem with Sissy's remains are legal, not theological. It cannot, it cannot matter to God where our corpses' ashes are nor, I suspect, does it matter to the dead. An opinion that was very similar to Ray's, as expressed by Marlowe in The Big Sleep. Uh, Bishop, Bishop Mercer goes on, however, in our sentimentality, we do for the ease of mourning, celebrating, like to have our loved ones, heroes, gathered together in the same place. I'm sure God is tender towards human sentiment. In a postscript, he added, if there is a petition, there is no reason for you and for me not to sign it. What we are here today for is to ensure the ease of mourning for both Sissy and Ray, to celebrate their great love, to honor their final wishes, and to pay our respects to one of the fathers of American hard-boiled detective fiction and the woman who loved him. As Annie and I began to put today's events together, uh, I came across some interesting coincidences. Ned Guyman, an avid collector of first edition mysteries, attended Ray's funeral in 1959, unbeknownst to his daughter, Janet Guyman Cassidy, who was the keyboardist over here in the Crown Island Jazz Band. She is playing here today, 51 years after Ray's funeral. Uh, the husband of Aisa Wayne, our brilliant attorney who secured the court order, uh, Scott Conrad, is an assistant editor and was the assistant editor on, Robert's Alt on Robert Altman's The Long Goodbye. And at dinner last night, he showed us a book of photos from that uh, motion picture. When they were making it, the cast and crew, including Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Very young in his pumping iron days. It went by the name Arnold Strong. <laughs> Ray's nephew, V. Edward Smith, was a China Clipper pilot, and his sporting pilot's license was signed by Al Al Orville Wright. <laughs> and Paramount Studios owned the 1929 Graham Page limousine that was used to ferry Sissy's Orange here today and to ferry all of us. Now, this is a big event. Two people can't organize such an event without help. And I would like to uh, thank the following people uh, without whom none of us would be here today. First and foremost, my wife, Annie Thiel, her drive and contacts and executive skills that turn my idea into reality. 
Well, I'd also like to thank Mike Coaster of Cypress View, whose testimony helped our case, and he handed me the urn just about a half hour ago. Uh, David Lugo was over here. He's the manager of Mount Hope. And uh, Maria and the other staff from Mount Hope for going to all his work today to have everything set up, and have everything organized and ready to go. Uh, Patrick DeCarolis, Esquire of Trope and DeCarolis, whose pro bono uh, legal work laid the groundwork for our court case. Aisa Wayne, Esquire, of course, who wrote the petition, filed the case, represented us in court, and won. Uh, Judge Richard S. Whitney, who had the judicial chops to go against the tradition dating back to Shakespeare's day. Don't blow my bones. Or curse you if you blow my bones. Uh, Bailiff Irving Escobedo, who shepherded us around the main courthouse and made sure we had no problems. Uh, Dorothy Fisher, Nate Gruber, Ray's secretary at Paramount, Woman uh, who inspired us in, in doing this, uh, Janet Diamond Cassidy, who read about our efforts, jumped aboard when I told her we were going to have a Dixieland jazz band. It was another coincidence, and uh, and the band, of course, for playing their wonderful music, the Crown Island Jazz Band. <laughs> Ann Lipscomb Hill, Esquire front row there, and the San Diego Historical Society, who provided immeasurable help in making this happen today. And Judith Freeman, also in the front row, who provided the wreath, and uh, who will be reading from her book, The Long Embrace, about Ray and Sissy. Uh, Jean Kalman, uh, for providing the 1927 and 1936 Cadillacs and the 1929 Graham Page that Paramount had. The back deck, and little seats on the front. Great. Also Powers Booth, sitting in the front row there, also known as Philip Marlowe, for coming here today and being our main speaker. Reverend Gar Randall Gardner, the rector of St. James by the Sea for his counsel and wonderful selection of readings you're gonna to hear today. And by the way, in case you didn't know, it was a retired rector of St. James that did the service for Sissy and for Ray when they died in 1954 and 59. And finally, to you, all the Raymond Chandler fans, for making this a reality. Thank you very much. Powers Booth. Powers Booth and Humphrey Bogard with the quintessential Philip Marlowe. And we have Powers here today, famous TV and movie star, and one of the best actors, I feel. In this day of, of reality shows and superficial movies, it's wonderful that it's still a few good actors around. Bogart's not with us, but Powers is. Powers is. Besides kind of being overwhelmed, because when I thought of Philip Marlowe, I thought immediately of Bogey. And I hadn't uh, read a lot of Chandler or anything uh, until that point. But I did immerse myself in his works and in the music of the era, like Arnie Shaw, and the big bands, and the blues. Once you read more Chandler, you start to hear that music in his words, and there's a rhythm and a tempo to it. And I must say before I go any further, that uh, after all this time to stand here by his grave and to be a part of the ceremony is uh, more than a little overwhelming to me. Because um, he was the artist that created the means by which I was able to create a character that was very moving and meaningful to me. 
and I was able to put it on the screen, and you don't often get to do that. So anyway, thanks, Ray. Um, Chandler, I, I, among any, many things, was known as the laureate of L.A. Of course, he described L.A. as a city with all the personality of a paper cup. <laughs> in assembling I, I, pieces uh, that he wrote and some of my favorite things, I could have spoken for two hours today, but I don't really want to. I, I've divided it up into several areas. So let's just start. Chandler says, ability is what you're capable of doing. Motivation determines what you do. And attitude determines how well you do it. And don't write any never write anything you don't like yourself and if you do like it don't take anyone's advice about changing it they just don't know he says if in doubt have three guys come through the door with guns <laughs> <laughs> this is how Raymond described his leading man down these mean streets a man goes who is not himself mean who is neither tarnished nor afraid. He is the hero. He's everything. He must be a complete man and a common man and yet an unusual man. He must be, to use a rather weathered phrase, a man of honor, by instinct, by inevitability, without thought of it and certainly without saying it. He must be the best man in his world and a good enough man for any world. He will take no man's money dishonestly and no man's insolence without a due and dispassionate revenge. He is a lonely man. And his pride is that you will treat him as a proud man or be very sorry you ever saw him. The story is this man's adventure and in search of a hidden truth. And it, will, and it would be no adventure if it did not happen to a man fit for adventure. If there were enough like him, the world would be a very safe place to live in without becoming too dull to be worth living in. Okay, put yourself as an actor and try to live up to that. <laughs> well, I did. <clears throat> so now I'm to go the only thing that'd be different would be at this point. I would this button I'm done. I would need a good cocktail, pistol under my arm, and of course a cigarette. Lots of cigarettes and lots of cocktails. But we don't have that. So I'd just like to keep in mind what was printed on my business card when I played Marlowe, which was Philip Marlowe, private detective. Trouble is my business. There was a desert wind blowing that night. It was one of those hot, dry Santa Anas that come down through the mountain passes and curl your hair and make your nerves jump and your skin itch. On nights like that, every booze party ends in a fight. Meek little wives feel the edge of the carving knife and study their husbands' necks. Anything can happen. You can even get a full glass of beer at a cocktail lounge. He snorted and hit me in the solar plexus. I bent over and took hold of the room with both hands and spun it. When it had nicely, when it, I had it nicely spinning, I gave it a full swing and hit myself on the back of the head with a floor. It was about 11 o'clock in the morning, mid-October, with the sun not shining and a look of hard wet rain in the clearness of the foothills. I was wearing my powder blue suit, a dark blue shirt, tie and display handkerchief, black robes, black wool socks with dark little clocks on them. I was neat, clean shaved and sober and I didn't care who knew it. I was everything a well-dressed private detective ought to be. I was calling on four million dollars. Who is this Hemingway person at all? The guy that keeps saying the same thing over and over until you begin to believe it must be good. <laughs> that must take a hell of a long time. <laughs> when I got home, I mixed a stiff one and stood by the open window in the living room and sipped it. And listened to the ground swell of traffic on Laurel Canyon Boulevard and looked at the glare of the big angry city hanging over the shoulder of the hills through which the boulevard had been cut. Far off, the banshee wail of police and fire sirens rose and fell. Never for very long, completely silent. 24 hours a day, somebody is running, somebody else is trying to catch it. Out there in the night of a thousand fires, people were dying and being maimed. Cut by flying glass, crushed against steering wheels and under heavy tires. 
People were being beaten, robbed, strangled, raped, and murdered. People were hungry, sick, bored, desperate with loneliness or remorse or fear. Angry, cruel, feverish, shaken by sobs. A city no worse than others. A city rich and vigorous and full of pride. A city lost and beaten and full of emptiness. It all depends on where you sit and what your private score is. I didn't have one. I didn't care. I finished the drink and went to bed. The main hallway of the Sternwood place was two stories high. Over the entrance doors, which would have let in a troop of Indian elephants, there was a broad stained glass panel showing a knight in dark armor rescuing a lady who was tied to a tree and didn't have any clothes on but some very long and convenient hair. The knight had pushed the visor of his helmet back to be sociable, and he was fiddling with the knots on the ropes that tied the lady to the tree and not getting anywhere. I stood there and thought that if I lived in the house, I would sooner or later have to climb up there and help him. He didn't seem to be really trying. Police business is a hell of a problem. It's a good deal like politics. It asks for the highest type of men, and there's no, nothing in it to attract the highest type of men, so we have to work with what we get. Does that sound You talk too damn much, and too damn much of it is about you. <laughs> I belonged in Idle Valley like a pearl onion on a banana split. <laughs> Under the thinning fog, the surf curled and creamed almost without sound, like a thought trying to form itself on the edge of consciousness. You know, what I do is all about great writing. Being a cop, I like to see the law win. I'd like to see the flashy, well-dressed mugs like Eddie Mars spoiling their manicures in the rock quarry at Folsom alongside of the poor little slumbred guys that got knocked over on the first caper and never had a break since. That's what I'd like. You and me both live too long to think I'm likely to see it happen. Not in this town. Not in any town half this size in any part of this wide, green, and beautiful USA. We just don't run our country that way. Alcohol is like love. First kiss is magic. Second is intimate. The third is routine. After that, you take the girl's clothes off. I like bars just after they open for the evening. When the air inside is still cool, clean, and everything is shiny, and the barkeep has given himself that look in the mirror to see if his tie is straight, his hair is smooth. I like the neat bottles on the bar back and the lovely shiny glasses and the anticipation. I like to watch the man mix the first one of the evening and put it down on a crisp mat and put the little folded napkin beside it. I like to taste it slowly. The first quiet drink of the evening in a quiet bar. That's wonderful. I needed a drink. I needed a lot of life insurance, I needed a vacation, I needed a home in the country. What I had was a coat, a hat, and a gun. I put them on and went out of the room. Quite appropriate for today. Dead men are heavier than broken hearts. There's no trap so deadly as a trap you set for yourself. You looked about as inconspicuous as a tarantula on a slice of angel food cake. I was as hollow and empty as the spaces between stars. Well, I'm as honest as you can expect a man to be in a world where it's going out of style. It seemed like a nice neighborhood to have bad habits in. I'm all done with hating you. It's all washed out of me. I hate people hard, but I don't hate them very long. Neither of the two people in the room paid any attention to the way I came in, although only one of them was dead. 
<laughs> hey, you're broke, eh? I've been shaking two nickels together for a month trying to get them to mate. <laughs> Hollywood. Had my books been any worse, I would not have been invited to Hollywood, and if they'd have been any better, I would not have come. <laughs> You can get past those awful idiot faces on the bleachers outside the theater without a sense of collapse of human intelligence, and if you can go out into the night and see half the police force of Los Angeles gathered to protect the golden ones from the mob in the free seats, but not from the awful moaning sound they give out, like destiny whistling through a hollow shell, if you can do these things and still feel the next morning that the picture business is worth the attention of one single intelligence artistic mind, then in the picture business you certainly belong because this sort of vulgarity, the very vulgarity from which the Oscars are made, is the inevitable price that Hollywood exacts from each of its serfs. Hollywood, ah, uh, it's big men are mostly little men with fancy offices and a lot of money. A great many of them are stupid little men with uh, Reach me down brain, small town arrogance, and a sort of animal knack of smelling out the taste of the stupidest part of the public. They have played in luck so long that they have come to mistake luck for enlightenment. Ever heard that, Scott? <laughs> All right. Hollywood's the kind of town where they stick a knife in your back and then have you arrested for carrying a concealed weapon. <laughs> Usually it's so quiet in Beverly Hills, you can hear the scratch of a fountain pen on a movie contract three mansions away. <laughs> My favorite, women. A love interest nearly always weakens mystery, the mystery because it introduces a type of suspense that is antagonistic to the detective struggle to solve the problem. It stacks the cards, and in nine cases out of ten, it eliminates at least two useful suspects. The only effective love interest is that which creates a personal hazard for the detective, but which, at the same time, you instinctively feel is a mere episode. Really, quick. never gets married. She lowered her lashes until they almost cuddled her cheeks and slowly raised them again like a theater curtain. I was to get used to that trick. That was supposed to make me roll over on my back with all four paws in the air. <laughs> I got down off the stool and stood waiting. She might or not, might not blow me down. I didn't particularly care. Once in a while, in this much too sex conscious country, a man and a woman can meet and talk without dragging bedrooms into it. This could be it. Or she could just be, think I was on the make, if so to hell with her. The latter think the shorter distance between two points is from a blonde to a bed. <laughs> It was a blonde, a blonde to make a bishop kick a hole in a stained glass window. <laughs> the Czech girl in peach bloom Chinese pajamas came over to take my hat and disapprove of my clothes. She had eyes like strange sins. She smelled the way the Taj Mahal looks by moonlight. The wet air was as cold as the ashes of love. It was a smooth, silvery voice that matched her hair. It had a tiny tinkle in it like bells in a doll's house. I thought that was silly, soon as I thought. When I left, Merle was wearing a bungalow apron and rolling a pie crust. She came to the door, wiping her hand on the apron, and kissed me on the mouth and began to cry and ran back into the house, leaving the doorway empty. I had a funny feeling as I saw the house disappear, as though I'd written a poem and it was very good and I'd lost it and never remember it again. I sat down on the edge of the deep, soft chair and looked at Mrs. Reagan. She was worth a stare. She was troubled. Well, I don't mind you showing your legs. They're very swell legs, and it's a pleasure to make their acquaintance. <laughs> Tall, aren't you, she said. I didn't mean to be. 
<laughs> Her eyes rounded. She was puzzled. She was thinking. I could see, even on that short acquaintance, that thinking was always going to be a bother to her. <laughs> from 30 feet away, she looked like a lot of class. From 10 feet away, she looked like something made up to be seen from 30 feet away. <laughs> he died in 1940 in the middle of a glass of beer. His wife, Jessie, finished it for him. <laughs> you shouldn't kiss a girl when you're wearing that gun. Leaves a bruise. <laughs> Did I hurt you much, sugar? You and every other man I ever met. Got him over. All right, here we go. This is... <clears throat> there are blondes and blondes, and it's almost a joke word nowadays. All blondes have their points, except perhaps the metallic ones who are as blonde as a Zulu under the bleach and as to disposition as soft as a sidewalk. There's the small, cute blonde who cheeps and twitters, and the big statuesque blonde who straight arms you with an ice blue glare. There's the blonde who gives you the up from under look and smells lovely and shimmers and hangs on your arm and is always very, very tired when you take her home. She makes that helpless gesture and has that goddamn headache and you would like to slug her except that you found out before the headache uh, the headache before you invested too much mo time and money and hope in her because the headache will always be there a weapon that never wears out and as deadly as the bravo's rapier or lucretia's poison vial <laughs> there's the soft and willing alcoholic blonde who doesn't care what she wears as long as it's mink, or where she goes as long as it's the starlight roof and there's plenty of dry champagne. There's a small perky bond who is a little pale and wants to pay her own way and is full of sunshine and common sense and knows judo from the ground up and can toss a truck driver over his shoulder without missing more than one sentence out of an editorial in the Saturday Review. <laughs> there's the pale, pale blonde with anemia of some non-fatal but incurable type. <laughs> she is very languid and very shadowy, and she speaks softly out of nowhere, and you can't lay a finger on her, because in the first place, you don't want to. <laughs> and in the second place, she is reading The Wasteland, or Dante in the original, or Kafka, or studying Provençal. <laughs> and lastly, there is the gorgeous showpiece who will outlast three kingpin racketeers and then marry a couple of millionaires at a million a head and end up with a pale rose villa at Cap d'Antibes, an Alfa Romeo town car complete with pilot and co-pilot, and a stable of shop-worn aristocrats, all of whom she will treat with affectionate absent-mindedness of an elderly duke saying goodnight to his butler. She gave me a smile I could feel in my hip pocket. This is a, a letter to, that Raymond wrote to uh, one of his editors. By the way, <clears throat> would you convey my compliments to the purist who reads your proofs and tell him or her that I write in a sort of broken down patois, which is something like the way a Swiss waiter talks? And that when I split an infinity, goddammit, I split it so it will remain split. And when I interrupt the velvety smoothness of my more or less literate syntax with a few sudden words of barroom vernacular, this is done with the eyes wide open and the mind relaxed and attentive. The method may not be perfect, but it is all I have. <laughs> wanted from this life even so? I did. 
why did you want? To call myself beloved. To feel myself beloved on the earth. Now, Raven was that. The French have a phrase for it. Those bastards have a phrase for everything, and they're always right. To say goodbye is to die a little. as one can with God's commandments and enjoying what this life provides. For everything, there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, 
A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Will you please stand if you're able to hear the words of Christ in the gospel? typewriter that he loved and adored because it was Italian and it was new. Uh, with blue typewriter a ribbon, he liked to use the blue typewriter ribbon. And the title of it, that as its type, says Untitled Poem. But in his handwriting, as you can see in red ink, he has scrawled across the front of it to an unknown love. It was written in 1957, and it was when he was living at Neptune Place. And it was given to my mother. And who knows who was in his heart when he came across these images that he has put down on paper, as whether he was thinking of his beloved sissy or whether he was thinking about my mother. <clears throat> they say the sun creates a joy in the soul. It bores me. They say the sweet air of the morning elevates the soul. That bores me too. I prefer to be in a soft bed with a gentle woman. The touch of her hand is much more beautiful than the smile of the sun. Only I may have the gentle hands. Anyone may breathe the sweet air of the morning. Only I may breathe the fragrance of her lips. 
Only I may see that light in her eyes. Only I. Take the world and the sun and the stars and dissect them all. And all that is left is charts and figures and intricate mathematical formulas. But what I have is a simple thing. The touch of a beloved hand. The smile of an adorable face. The sense of an eternity. The quietness of something resolved. The whole of life may exist in a single moment, but that moment must be complete. I am humbled before the thought that it could be mine. And beside Ray Chen. Ladies, don't you just wish, don't you just wish that a man had written to you that you the touch of your hand was more beautiful than the smile of the sun? I mean, on Valentine's Day. Here's the Ray's sister.